Hey, this is James Gall, and I'm with God Encounters Ministries based in Franklin, Tennessee. And I have the delight of, in the times in which we live, to launch something new that I've been waiting to do for years. We're calling it Insight with James W. Gall. And my co-host is my youngest daughter, married to McKendry. They got two little girls. And so this is Rachel Renee Tucker, my co-host. So Rachel, you want to greet the people? Hi, guys. I hope you're doing well. Um, we would love to hear where you are from. Where are you guys from? Where are you streaming from? Are you uh, in the US? Are you in Australia? Are you um, drop in the comments your name and where you're streaming from? Yeah, we, we would love to hear, give us your name. Now I know handles on emails and passwords or whatever this stuff is, it, it isn't always like recognizable on your name. But if you could tell us your name and I love to know like your city or your nation that you're from, because I know on social media today, there won't only be people from California or from New York or even from Nashville, Tennessee, or my former residents of Kansas City. But there will be people coming on from Brazil and South Africa and Nigeria and maybe South Korea and Australia and Singapore or wherever, or how about the United Kingdom? So we want to welcome you to the first of what we hope is going to be many of these uh, social media broadcasts called Insight. So Rachel, would you give us the theme verse for this new venture? Yes, we are really excited about this um, to frame it around Daniel 12, three, which is those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightest of the expanse of heaven and those who lead the many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. Hello. That is a, don't you just love that verse? Good. It's so timely historically for when it was written. And how about for the days in which we live? Amen. Let me share a little with you about Daniel Chapter 12, verse 3. Now, I've got it scribbled down on one of my little notepads, okay? Those who have insight, that's the branding we're using for this new show. Those who have insight will shine. You are going to shine. And it doesn't say you're going to be a dull light, or it's not going to be this little light uh, hiding under a bushel. No, it is a light set on a hill. Those are the words of Jesus that I'm quoting from Daniel, who was in exile. What does that mean? It means he was a Jewish believer, a prophet of God, who lived in Babylon. That would be modern day Iran. Mm the Iraq-Iran area. It's actually Iran. So here he is, a prophet of God. He's Jewish, and he's in the Chaldean area. That means, and he is in Babylon, so he is in what's called exile. He was not in his home. He was a captive, almost like a slave, taken into another land. And in the midst of that, he is saying, in the midst of captivity, in the midst of darkness, historically, Daniel is saying, those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the extreme. I love this terminology. It says, you will be extreme. Do you know that Daniel was extreme? I resemble this verse. I am extreme, and I want to be extreme, 
and I want to help raise up extreme shining bright lights in turbulent times. Those who have insight will shine bright, like the brightness of the extreme expanse of heaven, and those who will lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. I grew up in a little bitty town in Missouri called Calgill. It was 259 people. Now, we are now living in days that some it's called like a, a, a safe place or it's a shutdown or it's a quarantine or something like that. But you might feel like you're in captivity right now. But when I grew up, living in a little town of 259 people, there were not a lot of options of things to do. <laughs> uh, we didn't have, you know, all of these contraptions, you know. We didn't have social media. I mean, I actually literally remember when my dad brought home our first black and white television set. So that's how old I am. But that's not my point. Here's my point. One of the most intriguing, amazing things would be going out at night on a walk. I did lots of walks, but I would look up in the sky. And the sky to me, even when dark, would be illuminated, not just by the moon, but by the stars. The stars would light up the night. And you learned even if you weren't a scientist or, you know, a mathematician or something, but you'd look up and heaven would be speaking. Heaven was speaking to Daniel in a dark time in captivity in Babylon. For me, I would go out in a little bitty town and I would look up and the heavens for me were declaring the handiwork of God. And I remember trying to even count the stars. By the way, that's in the Bible too. God took Abram, who comes Abraham in the book of Genesis out and he tells him, count the stars. <laughs> It's really fun, by the way. In your downtime, maybe sometime go out on your porch or outside and try to count the stars because there's a promise. What is the promise? Those who have insight will shine bright like the brightness of the expanse of heavens, and they will be those who will lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So right here at the very beginning, I'm going to encourage you from this theme verse for insight that you can have insight and you can be a shining light that other people are looking towards. But we know we don't direct them to us. We turn and we direct them to the source of the light, which, of course, is God. So there's just a little opening on some um, of helping, like, give us some explanation and background to this social media broadcast insight and a theme verse of Daniel 12, 3 that we're using. Now, uh, let me tell you about a dream that I had, and then we'll uh, change gears. Now, I'm going to tell you about a dream that I had about mm, two and a half weeks ago. Obviously, I was just asleep. I have a dream that it was, <laughs> the dream, it was so fascinating because it was like I was Noah. I had a blueprint and it was all rolled out and I'm looking at this blueprint. I see myself actually in the dream. 
which on dream interpretation, that is one of the keys. Where are you in the dream? In this dream, I'm watching myself and I have a blueprint. And there was me and there was seven others, eight. Eight is a number of a new beginning. Huh, how many were with Noah? Eight. And I have a blueprint and we are now building an ark. And then we built an ark for eight, for family. Then it shifts. And then I start handing out blueprints to person after person after person after person. And they started gathering little clusters, little groups, maybe their family, their friends. And they then started building arcs as well. So in the dream, there was a multiplica multiplication from a blueprint to build arcs. But what were the arcs for? They were arcs of his presence. Then I wake up out of the dream and there was a knowing. It's like it just like rested on me. And this word is like sitting on me as I wake up out of this dream. And it's and I know this and it comes to me and it is as it was in the days of Noah. Huh as it was in the days of Noah. I believe that that's a key for us, for insight in the days in which we live. God wants to help you. He wants to help me. He wants to help us learn from his blueprint, which is obviously in this book, the Bible. And there, to build an ark of his presence, which I see at least three things here. It was for preservation, it was for provision, and it was to help carry a people from one era to the next for promise, a new beginning. These are those days. These are the days, like in the book of Daniel, where people who seek his face will get insight, and they will shine bright like the brightness of the heavens. And in days of storms, we'll have keys and insights to help other people move forward in life with protection provision, and moving into promise in Jesus' name. So there's a little bit of background, there's a scripture, and there's a, a dream storyline for you. I hope that that will be relatable to and helpful for some of you out there. I love that so much because um, I have, as my dad referenced earlier, I have two little girls at home. We have a three-year-old, a three-and-a-half-year-old, and, a, -year -old, a, -year -old, and um, a how old is she? She's four months, <laughs> a four month old. And uh, a lot of the times, even outside of being in a self quarantine time, which Tennessee right now is in a two week self quarantine time. I don't know where everyone else is living if you guys are going through that, but we are for our state. And um, the Lord has been speaking to me a lot about how do you, this is, this is, our environment. This is what we can control. This is what, um, like we literally own this property. So what, how can we preserve where we live? How can we bring the Lord's presence into right here? I'm like, I always pray. I'm like, Lord, that you have angels on every corner of our lot. And my husband travels a good bit. And so when he's gone, I'm always like, okay, God, your presence is surrounding this house. It's going to dwell inside this house. It's going to be inside each room, each of our girls' rooms, our room. And I love that because as we're home, we're literally getting to create that arc of his presence of preservation, but also just when you're home and when you go out, because obviously we are carriers of the Lord presence with us wherever we go but especially as we're home I'm like I keep feeling like this is a time of revival within for family units yes. where we can we actually get to learn how to have the presence of the Lord together versus just 
our, us all doing our individual things, right? That's right. You know, one of the things that's really <clears throat> kind of fascinating to me is that people are spending time together <laughs> and they might even be doing meals together. Imagine now, that. <laughs> imagine that. Now, see, in our raising of you guys, the four, you four kids, there was a regular thing for us to sit around the table and eat together. Now, in my growing up, my dad was at the head of the table. I was at the right side. Mom was over here at his left. There next to my mom was um, <clears throat> one of our, my older sisters. And on the other side of me was the other sister. So guess what? We all had our place at mm -hmm. the table. Yeah. You know what? That produced a certain dimension of security because we each knew we had our special place at the table. In these days, we need to go into redemptive insight. And this is an opportunity for personal renewal because revival is not just more great extended meetings. Revival is of the heart. And it needs to extend to the family. Right, Rachel? Yes, so good. I love that. Um, I also love the fact that you could do it anywhere you are in the world. And I'm looking in the comments from earlier from when people were um, kind of typing in where they're from. And if you just joined us, type in the comments, let us know where you are viewing from. Are you, I don't know, um, it, literally I'm looking here, I see, I see Guatemala, I see Northern Ireland, Boston, Idaho, Alaska. Um, we have Pennsylvania and Texas. I saw, where did I see earlier? Um, there was some other countries that I saw earlier, Egypt. South Africa, so cool. The fact that we can be gathering together all across the world right now. So if you're, you're just hopping on, or if you're watching the live replay or not live, but the replay of this, we would love like hop on there, type in the comments, let us know where you guys are from. But um, dad, you were telling me earlier about that a word, which I actually remember as a kid hearing you release this word about e-church. Uh -huh. Can you, oh, first, first before that, also while people are doing comments, I just, we're going to do a, a time of Q&A really quickly. So if you guys, after this section, type in some questions that you have concerning the subject, because we want to address those questions live and um, have a little interchange. But before we do that, um, Dad, can you go ahead and go into that word about e-church? Sure. Now, you just mentioned Egypt. Yeah. So I have to touch Egypt. One of the words I have carried for a decade has been about Egypt and how I've had dream after dream after dream about the nation of Egypt and that God has a promise for the nation of Egypt because mm -hmm. God remembers the act of protection and preservation of baby Jesus when there was the word that was sent out on murdering all the firstborn, the, 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 the little boys. And so Mary and Joseph actually went into exile themselves. Where? Into Egypt. And Egypt became a land of protection. And I have been, and I am prophesying right now, that there is a move of the Holy Spirit that is breaking out in Egypt. And I have seen Coptic Orthodox priests coming under a mantle of miracles, signs, and wonders, and healings. I am not limiting, limiting this to the Coptic Orthodox priest, but I know what I have seen. And I declare over Egypt right now that you are coming into some of your best days, even when it seems dark and intense, Egypt is going to be a shining light because God remembers your act of preservation. Now, this builds into what Rachel asked me about. She says, could you tell us, recite this word from some years ago about e-church? I was in Alberta, Lethbridge, Canada at the Miracle Channel, 
and I was filming some of the uh, beginning television shows for Patricia King, my dear, dear, dear friend. And I started prophesying that e-church, now I personally had not heard that terminology used before. That meant electronic church. But what I said was e-church would come forth in a time when it would be relevant and of necessity. I prophesied this at least 18 years ago. This last couple of weeks, I have been having the Holy Spirit bring to my remembrance numerous words that I have received and released over, let's say, the last 30 years. So this week, I relived a clip in a dream of where I'm prophesying and each church when it is relevant and it will be of necessity. I wake up out of that short vision dream clip of me prophesying that, and the Holy Spirit says to me, these are those days. So e-church, electronic church, it is not a replacement, and it is not to displace what we know, but it is timely, it's relevant, and it's what we're doing in a sense right now, and it is of necessity. So I'm going to encourage you all out there that you are the church. Hey, Rachel, we attend a, a congregation in Nashville called The Belonging, <clears throat> and often the uh, senior pastors, Henry and Alexandry, Henry in particular will say, what at the end of the service? Church, wait, service is over, but church is not. <laughs> okay, now listen, that's a great line. But it really not, is. <laughs> not just a lot. It's not just a line though. Yeah. Service is over, but church is not. Hmm. Because where two or three are gathered together in his name, there Jesus is in our midst. So there is a little additional word along with the ark of his presence on each church because these are those days. That's so good. Um, I'm going on here and I'm looking for questions you guys have concerning this topic of insight, which to go over the theme verse for today is because someone asked in the comments, what is the verse? It's Daniel 12, 3. And that verse is those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Oh, it's, it's so grand, honestly. I love how massive of a perspective that is because we could get so um, small, small minded, you know, focus on our little, little problems, little, our, our little lives, you know, but God's like, look at the expanse, like how grand. Um, so keep uh, commenting in the, in the Facebook comments, questions you have about these subjects, maybe about um, James's word. It's funny to call you James. I'm going to be honest because you're my dad, <laughs> but um, I have one question from, let me pull it over, from Wilmer. How do you increase in insight? Good, fairly good. How do you increase in insight? Because you see, we can't just go to the promise. We have to meet the condition. Those who have insight it says, then there's the promise. But it says, those who have insight will shine bright like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. How do you grow in insight? Pray the Bible. Number one, pray the word of God. I do believe I have, uh, this is, I don't mean to see, be pointing to myself but I'm going to use an illustration. I do tend to have a spirit of wisdom that rests upon my life. But is that a gift or is that something that was cultivated 
or is it something I inquired? Maybe all of the above. But what I did was I prayed the word of God, and I still do. In particular, for insight, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 to 19. I literally prayed Ephesians chapter 1, 17 to 19 every day for 10 straight years. Now, you don't have to do that, but that is part of my seminary. It's a part of my training. So I would pray. I pray that you be, I be filled with the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that the eyes of my heart will be enlightened, that I might know the hope of his calling, the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe, and then the excellencies of his his greatness, of his treasure that lives inside of us. I prayed that verse for 10 straight years every day, and I still pray it at least every week. So how do you grow an insight? Number one, pray the Bible. Pray like the book of James where it says, you have not because you ask not. Oh, so what are you going to do with it? Now we're going to pray the word, then we're going to act on the word. You might say, James, this is like too simple. Oh, it, it is. Simple keys. Listen, little keys open big doors. Little keys open big doors. So pray the Bible. Second, worship God. Daniel, what did Daniel do? He did not bow his knee to any other foreign, uh, to a foreign god when he was in exile in Babylon. He only bowed his knee, even in times of darkness, to the one true God, Jehovah. I want to encourage you to be a war. One, pray the word. Two, be a worshiper. And three, find your tribe. What? Find a people. It doesn't have to be two or three hundred. It doesn't have to be two and three million. Find two and three that you can pray together, walk together, and have a form of encouragement and accountability. So three simple things to grow in insight, and there's a whole lot more. What? Number one, pray the word of God. Number two, be a worshiper. Number three, walk in community because iron will sharpen iron. So it's a little bit, and there's a whole lot more on how to grow in info. I love that. Um, we have, I love this question because it is so relatable. Tracy has asked, I'm struggling because I want to be ready to do kingdom work, but have found that I am in need of a lot of soul healing. Can someone who still needs a lot of work still be used by God for the end time work? I feel like I'm behind on maybe where I should be. Wow, great. You know, I, you know, having grown up and moved through many different movements of the Holy Spirit, one of them was called the third wave movement. And one of the primary apostles or messengers, leaders, was John Wimber. And John Wimber, I remember this so well, who had a worldwide ministry of signs and wonders. He talked about wounded healers. Because, mm -hmm. see, grace, grace, anything that's lasting, Anything that's really fruitful is not because you're perfect. It's because of God's great grace. And then when God moves through a weak vessel, who gets the credit? He does. Because you will not receive it to yourself. So I want to encourage this person. I'm in a still in a journey. 
I had dreams again this morning on healing some trauma issues. Yes, I did. You will continue in your journey in healing, but your goal is not perfection. Your goal is to have his grace working in you and through you because God uses cracked pots. That's from the book of Jeremiah. Go to the house of the potter because the pot was cracked and God will remake it and God will use it. And I want to speak a blessing to this person and to many others. I just say to you, Jesus has come to heal the brokenhearted and to set at liberty those who are bruised. And so I just say to this person, I say divine creativity is going to come upon you and a certain dimension of, again, divine creativity coming upon you. And you are going to get over morbid introspection, turning inward too much. And he's going to shift you who you tend to be a contemplator or might be considered an introvert. And God is going to move upon you and help change things so that you know you are a light bearer and you make a difference. So I bless you with that. By the way, somebody is getting touched by the fire of God in their intestines, and I see a healing happening for what might be called diverticulitis. So there's intestinal gut issues, and the Holy Spirit is touching, oh, and because the root is rejection. So mm -hmm. I speak the, uh, okay, I speak a father's blessing over that particular person. I bless you as a father in the faith, and I just say, you are just really pleasing to God. I love, wow, come on. That's amazing. Um, speaking of, if you guys have any friends that should be watching this video, tag them in the comments because we want, if, if you have a friend who has diverticulitis, we wanna make sure that they see this um, because this is not limited to just live. Uh, a lot of people will watch the replay of this. Um, to close on, on a question, which I think is very relatable for everyone that we're going, that literally is affecting the entire world is coronavirus. And um, I have two people that ask similar questions. They're slightly different, but I'm gonna group them together. Teresa asked any insight for the end of the virus. And then um, I don't know this person's actual name, her handle for Facebook is Little Morning Dew. How long has it been prophesied for the pandemic to last? So we're talking about the virus, but then we're also talking about a pandemic. So the fear yes. of, um, this, of this epidemic. Yes, uh, obviously there's many different prophetic voices. And I have the honor and privilege of walking with many of them around the world. Chuck Pierce uh, in Denton, Texas, a very close friend, one of the highest level, what I would uh, refer to as an Issachar prophet, prophesied in September of 2019 that there would be a plague, a global plague would be released at around the first of the year, and that though when Passover came, it would be a time of passing over. Now, Passover is like a uh, one of the three great Jewish feasts. We relate Easter as it would be to Passover. So as we approaching Passover, Chuck Pierce said, the plague would be global. He said a plague, but he said it would, I don't think he said it would end, but it would start to like pass over at Passover. Now, I gave words about 5780, that's the Hebrew year, and then also 2020 and beyond. And I prophesied days of chaos and confusion. Well, that's what this overlaps. But in the dreams that the Lord gave me last fall was that there would be times of chaos and confusion, but it would not have the final word. And the Lord would bring new alignments new assignments, and that there would be um, um, 
everywhere there was chaos and confusion, the Lord would bring a hope solution of new beginnings, that there would be restructuring. Everywhere there was confusion and chaos, it would become an opportunity for divine order, was the word. So, did this take God by surprise? Not in the least bit. Some of the Lord's servants saw this ahead of time. I could give you Bob Jones talked about two different plagues. John Paul Jackson, a seer friend who's both of them are with the Lord, prophesied about two different plagues. One that would, would be more about fear, and then another one that would come later. These are the days in which we live. But the issue is the pandemic of fear. You know what? There's some things you are, we are not in charge of. There are some things we are. We are in charge of our sphere. And in your sphere, you can keep out the, pan, the pandemic is actually a spirit of fear. The virus is real. But the pandemic is a global assault of a spirit of fear. We have authority as believers in Jesus over our sphere of influence, your life, your family, your sphere of influence. So in the name of Jesus, we exercise authority of the finished work of the cross, and we say no to panic attacks. We say no to hoarding. We say no to fear in the name of Jesus, because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power and love and a sound mind. Now, Rachel, there was another couple of like thoughts that was with that question. Could you try to like uh, rehearse that back to me so I can like uh, close out with this? Yeah. How long has it been prophesied for this pandemic to last was one of them. And then the, the other question was any insights for the end of the virus? Okay, so I want to talk about quarantine for a moment. Huh, really? Yeah. Did you under, did you know that that's actually biblical? Doing a quarantine? It's a biblical remedy to, it's in the book of Leviticus and other places, the health laws. The health laws of the Old Testament are still, have application for us today. And so a quarantine, let's say it was like leprosy you weren't supposed to be near a person because it could be like transmitted. So there were social distancing. That was biblical to contain the disease. Social distancing, folks, is a biblical application to confront pandemic viruses and plagues. Mm -hmm. Social distancing is. Noah, again, they went into a place of protection for a time of new beginning. I could give you multiple examples out of the book of Leviticus and other places. Or how about Psalm 91? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So how long is it going to last? I think the pandemic of fear is up to you how long it lasts. Because you can walk in faith and favor and provision no matter what. So draw your own circle, keep out fear, be a worshiper. But when is this going to end? I do not know. Sean Bowles has been given very direct revelation to encourage people that there will not be millions that will die by the coronavirus. And I totally agree with that. I actually believe that there will be more that will actually die. Sorry, I don't even like using that word from influenza than what's actually going to die from the coronavirus. That's because we will have cooperated. We will have cooperated with ways of God of even quarantine and faith. And declaration and worship, etc. Now, one other thought, how long will it last? I don't know. I feel that 
we have the month of April, March, April, that I personally think that it's still going to be pretty intense. I believe that come around May that, that there will be a shift. Now, I don't know that I know that I know that. And yet at the same time, my knower says, I believe in May there will be a shift. I believe in May there will be a shift. I didn't say a total lift, but there will be a shift that will happen in May. But here's the issue. There will be a lot of rebuilding that is going to have to happen. Economic structures and a lot of things. But we can receive hope solutions in this time when we are like quarantined, in this time when we are alone, God is going to release an increase of revelation in these days to help you become hope solutionist in Jesus' name. That's so good. Um, well, to close out, I just want to encourage you guys, if this is something you can do being at home, um, we have a class called The Scribe on receiving and retaining revelation through journaling. And you can be a part of that class literally anywhere you live, which is, I mean, we're all at home right now. So it's kind of a perfect time to hop on to class, but you can go to godencounters.com or scribe777.com to um, find out more about that class. And then um, also we just, Co we have so many free resources on our website. It's kind of insane. Um, we have emails that go, content emails that go out every week. We have audio messages. We also do a podcast every week. Literally, the um, it it you could spend so many hours alone on the free resources we have. Let alone these in depth classes, which I'm like, those are so deep. They're so rich. They have so much wisdom for us to just grow as believers there's actually like a whole mentorship program so i encourage you guys to go to godencounters.com kind of poke around on there find there, literally like on almost every single subject for spiritual growth we have classes and books on so go there check that out um i've loved being on here with you guys this has been super fun hey, this has been great so this is installment number one and you let us know if you have been inspired, equipped, helped, and you could even send us some comments. What are some things, some topics that you would like for me to share from out of having walked with Jesus for at least 50 years and having been in full-time vocational ministry for 47? So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. This is James Gall, along with my co-host, Rachel Renee Tucker, for the first installment of Insight for the Days in Which We Live. God bless you. God bless you guys.